Now, there's a, a very good reason why I want to talk to my next guest, who is a professor of philosophy of religion at Cambridge, right? Associate professor, but thanks for promoting no, me. No, you're a professor. I'm not prepared <laughs> to argue about this. James Orr, everything that I looked at when I got interested in religion was an effort for me because I had to uproot all the assumptions that I got from being in a Christian culture for umpteen years. Can you talk a little mm. bit about that? Mm. Well, John, what happened to you happened to the West about 500 years ago. Um, you know, once upon a time, the, the religion didn't really mean anything as something that was just a distinct tradition. You know, once upon a time, there was no secularism, there was no real religion. Everything was Christian, loosely, everything was Christendom. And so it's only really when, you know, when the West moved out and started to, in the age of exploration in particular, started realizing there are these very sophisticated belief systems elsewhere in the world. Yeah. And so that's when people started thinking, well, uh, well, gosh, there are other traditions here, there are other belief systems, which one's right? And then, so religion emerges alongside secularism. Um, the idea that actually, if we're gonna make sure we haven't got any wars over this stuff, because people feel this, these beliefs pretty deeply, we should make sure we've got a nice neutral public square. And so we should start privatizing these, these beliefs. Um, but I think when, the t when you were coming of age, um, not so long ago, um, <laughs> the, the, the world was opening up to all sorts of different traditions and Britain was opening up to um, migrant communities who were believing different things and we were trying to navigate these different, different belief systems. And so it, it was a, there was a sort of sense of dislocation, uh, yeah. a sense of something that we were, were so familiar to us as starting, who is, is not obvious to everybody. I mean, the, one of the assumptions was that most religions have a god, right? Then I discover that Hinduism uh, can be said to have lots of god, mm. and of course, Buddhism doesn't have any at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, if there's been a a fascinating treasure hunt in the last 50 years among scholars uh, who study religion for uh, the meaning of religion. And it turns out, 50 years on, they still can't quite work out what the definition of a religion is. Really? Uh, because, as you say, there are all sorts of traditions that we'd want to say, that's definitely a religion. But they don't seem to be theistic. They don't really seem to have a sort of God as the object of their worship in quite the way that we would understand. So I think maybe a better way of thinking about it is, you know, what are the sort of features of, of religious belief? And there are lots and lots of ingredients that go into the mix. There's often a sort of sense of the sacred, something that needs yeah. to be set apart around which the society can sort of build itself. There's, um, there's a ritualistic element often. Yes. There's an emotional element. It's something that, that isn't just a, to do with the mind and just to do with cognition, but, but meaning. What, what satisfies, you know, the sense of the yearning for, for some uh, some explanation for, for the way the world is, that you guys satirised so well in, in the meaning of life. <laughs> and, and that's something that, that it's not just religious people come to think of, but also philosophers. I mean, yeah. think, of, think of Aristotle. Aristotle says, you know, what sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom is that we're driven by a desire to understand. It's a very, very strange feature of, of human beings that, that we should sort of yeah. You know, that they should spend their afternoon sitting down talking about <laughs> things like religion. Yeah. It's very curious behaviour for the animal <laughs> kingdom. Um, and so religion, you can think of religions as a sort of the, the human response or expression or, 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 a, 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 or the human attempt to reach a certain set of answers mm. about questions of fundamental concern, yeah. questions of ultimate concern. What is ultimate, it going to be? Yeah, ultimate concern. Because he's the most important. And that might be a god, it might be Jesus, it might be Brian. <laughs> it, 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 or it might be Brian's gourd, or it might be Brian's sandal. You know, there's a focal point for the sacred around which a group can organise themselves and start making sense yeah. of the world. But your idea or clar that clarity is important to mm -hmm. defining the members and all that kind of thing, that isn't true of some of the Eastern religions because that's more about practice than... than uh, theology. Yes, I mean, there's an enormous sort of mix of, of practice and theology, and in fact, very profound philosophy. And when we talk about theology and we talk about philosophy, we sometimes forget that there's actually no difference between the two before, certainly in the West, before around about, what, 1600. 
both were ways of trying to answer the fundamental questions. And yeah. so in Hinduism, in the Eastern traditions, you have these incredibly sophisticated philosophical treaties um, from millennia before that, that talk, um, uh, that, that try to understand how what, what human beings are and what the nature of ultimate reality is. The case of Brahma, for example, or the ground of being. The genius of most of the great religions is that they recognize that the sort of deep philosophical questions don't, don't sort of disseminate very well to those who are not thinking about philosophy. And so you need, you need propositions, you need clarity, and also you need rituals. And you need where and you, you so want... rituals. We're talking about. Are we talking about spiritual practices? Or could be more spiritual than that? practices. They could be private spiritual practices of private devotions and so on. Or they could simply be public um, uh, practices. Just sort of you know crossing yourself before going to church, a meal, just just turning up mm -hmm. uh, and just doing it without without thinking very much. And that's that's an important feature of religion, particularly in our, this day and age, when we're so disembodied, staring at our screens the whole time. And uh, we can't see, you know, we, 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 there's a real, there's, there's, a, there's a, a great sort of difficulty in um, trying to sort of, well, we tend to detach ourselves. Technology detaches us, mm -hmm. dislocates us from our embodied practices, as it were. And so religion has a, is, is a good anchor for that. Um, ah. it's, it's potent, and that's something that just mere beliefs and propositions and creedal statements don't, don't really deliver.